Photosynthesis in Part 3 of Microfilm 101. Reduction Ratio. It's the mathematical difference between the size of the physical document and its reduced size on microfilm. Reduction ratio is expressed as an X, along with a number that implies the scale of the reduction, such as 10X for a paper reduced 10 times its original size. In newspaper microfilming, low to medium reduction ratios are pretty standard. The larger reduction ratios are more typical of 16 millimeter in microfiche. Reduction ratio directly affects image quality and OCR accuracy. Anything above 24x for newspapers and the text just gets too small. Digitally, reduction ratios over 20x can be problematic for reaching a true 300 dpi, which is the minimum dpi for NDNP. Newspapers by their nature are large documents with small text and thus require a low reduction ratio for the best reproduction. The bigger a page image is on the microfilm, the better it will resolve on the analog film and digitally as well. In other words, bigger is better. Orientation or position refers to the placement of the page on the film. There are two positions, cine and comic. In the cine position, the long side of the newspaper runs parallel to the film edge, while in the comic position, the long edge is perpendicular to the film edge. Further, there are two standard position terms in newspaper microfilming, 1A and 2B. The number refers to the number of pages in each exposure, and the letters refer to the actual position of the paper on the film, where A is cine and B is comic. I've mentioned that preservation microfilm is black and white film, but let's look at this a little bit more. Preservation microfilm is high contrast, panchromatic, monochrome film. That is, it is black and white film that is sensitive to all colors in the visible spectrum, which are translated as shades of gray, with a high degree of difference between maximum black and maximum white. This kind of film produces the best text resolution, but because of the high contrast nature, photographs and illustrations suffer loss of detail, disturbingly so in some instances. To compensate, microfilmers will sometimes make two exposures to accommodate both the photos and the text, but this doesn't happen very often, so don't get your hopes up. Of course, color microfilm and continuous tone black and white microfilm have been explored, but they've each been discarded for preservation use. The dye in color film, for example, simply won't last over time. Heat and moisture destroy the dyes. Even in a stable environment and in complete darkness, the dye will fade fairly quickly. Continuous tone film solves the photo reproduction problem by reproducing detail very well, but to manage this requires different film, different development, or both. The trade-off is lesser textural resolution, which, in digitization, needs to be at a premium. Most shops are simply not set up for continuous tone microfilm work, and many feel the gains in detail aren't worth the time, cost, or loss of text clarity. Now, a word about density readings. You might take your own density readings, or you might have a vendor do them. Either way, density readings must be taken if you make a print master or positive microfilm, and since digitization from a print master is required for NDNP, you should probably know a little something about it. You'll hear D-min and D-max mentioned often. These are measured by a densitometer with numerical values between 0.10 and 1.5. D-min simply refers to the density of the film base. To find the D-min, take a reading of the film that has not been exposed or fogged by light, usually in the liter near the first exposure. By current standards, the D-min should not exceed 0.10. D-max refers to the density of the object on the film. These readings are taken from an area of the artifact, like a newspaper, in which there is no photo or text, only blank paper. Ads are excellent for density readings, for instance. The edges of newspapers are handled the most and are nearest to the light when stacked and folded, so they become damaged and discolored faster than the rest of the paper. Density readings taken from an edge won't fairly represent the paper as a whole. Determining a true D-max for a reel of microfilm requires 6 to 10 readings throughout the reel to find the average. This average is then used to properly create a duplicate negative or positive generation microfilm. We talk about density readings in terms of low, medium, and high contrast. Low contrast density runs 0.80 to 1.00. Anything faint will do best for original microfilming with low contrast densities, like faint text or handwriting and pencil on dark paper or papers that are tissue-like. Bold print or handwriting on moderately dark papers will do best in the medium contrast range from 0.90 to 1.10. High contrast density is perfect for bold print on crisp white paper, such as current newspapers. High contrast readings run 1.00 to 1.30. You'll notice that there's some overlap within these designations. This is natural since the density reading is taken from the background of the artifact, not the text, and the contrast of the original documents can be highly subjective if you're just eyeballing the paper. Microfilmers will do step tests to determine which density range is best. 
if you're an NDNP awardee, these density ranges won't mean as much since you're digitizing from microfilm made long before now. However, in the off chance that you're making microfilm specifically to digitize as part of NDNP, these density ranges are very important to know. For newspapers of average text quality, current standards for camera master negative density should be no lower than 0.80 and no higher than 1.2 throughout the reel. NDNP prefers a narrow margin with variations in density readings of no more than 0.2 within an image and between exposures. Don't panic if your film suffers a wider variation than this. Pre and early USNP film very often does. It doesn't mean you can't get good digital images. The truth is, you can get just about any density reading you want if you're willing to look for it long enough. Really good darkroom technicians know how to get the most accurate readings throughout a reel to make the best overall print master. Much the same can be said for resolution, too. Current standards recommend resolution patterns or line pairs resolved at 8.0 and 7.1 at reduction ratios 16x and 20x, respectively. NDNP takes into consideration the varying reduction ratios, cameras, and moving standards over time and therefore recommends that the master negative resolution line pairs resolve at 5.0 or higher. You may run across film that has no resolution target. For master negatives without a resolution chart, you can estimate the resolution by comparing the film without a target to film with a target, or, if you're lucky, to the original documents. For either questionable density readings or resolution, do not discount the film. Call the Library of Congress and talk with them if it doesn't meet the specification. They'll help you work through the problem. If you're an Indian P awardee, you'll need to make a print master negative from which to digitize. Consider splices. Print masters are direct duplicates of the camera master. They shouldn't have splices. Since print masters are generally made through contact printing, splices can wreak havoc on the dupe film. Ultrasonic splices or zipper splices may be the worst, but cement, heat weld, and glue splices are hardly better. They're so much taller than the film that they create a sort of speed bump that on the print master will blur two or more images after the splice. At UK, we replace all splices with splice tape because it offers the least resistance during duplication and eliminates image blur due to splicing. You might think about doing that or ask your vendor to. Now, let's talk about cameras for a second. The most typical camera in newspaper microfilming is a planetary camera. Some of the new models have excellent optics, and some can even capture in digital as well. However, the most widely used camera then, as now, is the industry workhorse MRD and MRC cameras made by Kodak. You can practically throw them off a roof and they'll still work. Plus, optically, there's little resolution difference compared to newer models. Perhaps the most beautiful thing about these old cameras is their simplicity. They're not that different from those portable models in basic design but key aspects have greatly improved. They now provide uniform illumination with four or more lights and a voltage regulator to control proper and consistent density. Their optical resolutions are as good now as they were 30 or 40 years ago. And like I said, there's little appreciable difference in optics from newer expensive cameras. And their copy stand is able to produce proper reduction ratios for even the largest newspapers. There are a few other things that are important to know for preservation microfilm. You'll need archival quality storage reels, boxes, or any enclosure that won't off-gas or turn acidic. Note that just because a manufacturer says their storage products are archival doesn't mean they are. The Photographic Activity Test, or PAT for short, is an international standard that ensures an enclosure is suitable for long-term storage of photographic materials. Most reputable manufacturers will include PAT testing on their product labels. This seal of approval will get you a product that is free of glues, inks, acid, and chemicals that cause oxidization. Once you've got the right storage containers, storing microfilm, especially the camera master, in a stable environment is essential. An atmosphere of about 65 degrees Fahrenheit with relative humidity of 35% plus or minus 5% is ideal. In this environment, the silver gelatin polyester-based microfilm will last 500 years. Have I mentioned it will last 500 years? <laughs> To create this environment takes space, of course, like a vault, and recurring funds for maintenance over hundreds of years. It isn't enough to simply build a perfect microfilm nest. The mechanical units that create the stability will need maintenance, and they will eventually die. They'll need replacing. The same can be said for the lighting, electrical circuits, and maybe even the storage units themselves. Keep in mind that the life expectancy of the microfilm, even without a stable environment, is longer than our current digital storage units like mainframes, floppy disks, zip disks, or even CDs. Creating a stable environment might seem like a long-term hassle, but it has long-term benefits that no other preservation medium offers. Happy microfilming, and remember, never, ever, 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 ever panic.